with um, Kalshi's, uh, my favorite co-founder of Kalshi, <laughs> Luana. Um, Kalshi, for those who don't know, is the uh, only real money prediction market in the US that is definitely legal. We'll see how the sweepstakes stuff goes, but for now, uh, definitely legal. Um, and this next hour should hopefully just be uh, interesting chat between the two of us, and then we'll open it up to audience questions like halfway through. Um, you can ask all of your, your burning questions about what it's like to have to ask the CFTC for permission to do everything. Um, so I guess my, the first question, the, the thing maybe on everyone's mind is, are we going to get election markets on Kalshi? Like, what's the deal with that? That's a that's a great question. Well, as a bit of a background for for whoever doesn't know, like, with yeah, we are as you said uh, the f first big legal prediction market in the U.S. that uh, is fully regulated by the CFTC and um, election. We've been working on election markets for around two and a half years uh, with the CFTC, and we did a process with them to 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 do it like we do every other market we've launched hundreds of markets at this point and each of them it's a day we just send them in the morning at night we can already list them but election markets of course they were more worried about it we did a way longer process um, they ended up rejecting the market um, and we sued them on it and we now are in the middle of this lawsuit um, we had a the the court hearing was last week and it was very very positive on our side so we are optimistic um, I do think eventually we are right on the on the legality of it, um, and eventually we, I'm very confident that we're going to have these markets. But whether it's going to be for this year or not, it depends on how this part of the lawsuit um, goes. Um, another, I guess, interesting and important part of this is that the CFTC, of course, they really don't like election markets uh, for a lot of different reasons that I obviously think are not good reasons, um, such as like they're going to destroy democracy or or people are going to change their votes because they are trading a certain, if they buy a Trump position, now they're going to vote for Trump um, and a lot of different things like that. And they're trying to stop it also through uh, a new regulation. Uh, but the grounds of the regulation are very similar to the lawsuit, so we're finding them like together. Uh, but actually, they are open to comment, comment from the public right now on this new regulation banning election markets. So if you want to tell the CFT that you like these markets, or I guess if you don't like these markets, you can tell them too. Um, you can you can do that online uh, right now. We're actually going to put the link in the Discord. And they actually have an obligation to review every single one of those comments and respond to, uh, to them. So it's actually very helpful uh, for everyone. But we are hopeful and we are going to see this through. I mean, we really believe in these markets. We've been working on Kaushi for five years on these markets for almost three. So um, we will go up until we can get these markets uh, whatever that whatever that takes so long time <laughs> if someone were to submit a comment i'm curious what do you think the most effective arguments are for like why prediction markets should exist to the cftc and then like what you personally your favorite reason is like whether it's you know hedging or yeah. information aggregators whatever that that's a great question i think this, the cftc has a couple of arguments i think the main one is that i guess there's Two big ones. One is that there's no economic utility to these markets, that elections are too random for you to be able to hedge anything with them, and that the impact isn't clear. Doesn't that make hedging more useful? Exactly, right? Like if you think about if you think about a hurricane or like any weather event, it's you know, even though there you can forecast, it's somewhat random in some way, and hedging is even more important. Um, but it is very important for them to hear from people like how do you think about why is hedging on elections important? Is there actually an economic impact uh, from Republicans or Democrats being in power and all those things? And the other side is like really the election integrity point. It's like they're worried um, people are going to change their votes. There's going to be less faith in the democratic process because people are going to think that the election was manipulated because of X, Y, Z reason. Um, so there's a lot of different things. And I think that it all boils down to them saying that trading on elections is gambling. And... That is mainly because they see no economic purpose. They see it as kind of like a, a sport. Uh, and I think that there's, to me, clear clear difference between the two. Uh, for me, what I personally think is more interesting and is also behind one of the biggest reasons we started Kaoshi is the information that these markets bring. Um, and I think everyone that's in this conference understands that, that point. Um, but I think it's very important, especially in such a polarized world, to have access to this data. Um, and I hope that we can, we can see this live uh, this year. Actually, speaking of why people use Kalshi, um, I know you guys uh, 
have an unusual amount of like institutional investors uh, or like you know hedge funds and groups like that uh, bought into the platform. So I was hoping you could talk more about I don't know how the dynamics are different when you're when a lot of your your biggest traders are like institutions rather than you know D Gens or something. Yeah, that's that's actually a very uh, interesting point that I think it's kind of really what makes Scalchi very different from a lot of what's been talked about here is like our long term goal is for us to be like the New York Stock Exchange for events and for us to be that kind of like centerpiece of, of this big financial ecosystem that, that we hope to build. But the, of course, the biggest part of it is that we need the ecosystem to be big because no one you, being at the center of a very small party is not very exciting. Um, so for us, it, when we started the company, we actually came to prediction markets, both me and my co-founder, from a very different angle, I guess, than, than the traditional one. We came from like the very finance. We were in trading and we realized that most trading at like Bridgewater or Goldman was, what do you think is going to happen in the future? And then you find a way to put that in the markets. But it's not direct, right? Like you can think that Brexit's going to happen, but you can't just go and buy that Brexit's going to happen. You have to find, oh, maybe if I short this or if I go along this or if I trade it this way. Uh, and there's a lot of other problems. Of course, they're very liquid markets, but the proxies are not exactly what, what you want to get exposure to. And there's a lot of risk there. So we came from that angle and our goal was, we want to build a legal prediction market event contracts exchange um, that we can make people from like, I don't know, Joe on the corner all the way to, to Goldman Sachs trade. And that's why regulation for us is so important is like, we can't get Goldman Sachs and we can't get SIG and we can't get um, all of these people to trade if it's in, you know, illegal, kind of offshore, kind of all these things. Um, and for us, it, the, a lot of the question is like, how do we make it an ecosystem that fits everyone. I think our, our initial strategy was focused first on retail because retail is usually smaller size, but higher velocity. So you need like lower liquidity to, to, to deal with that versus like if you have a big fund, they're going to go like, I want to take a 50 million position at once. We just don't have the liquidity for that. But our goal really is to expand to, to more and more. So recently we, we announced that uh, Susquehanna, which is a very big uh, market maker, uh, is trading on Kaoshi and we also have funds on the other side. Uh, onboarding and trading more and more. And I really, I think the goal for prediction markets is for them to be very mainstream. And there's no way to do that without these, these participants coming in and, and, uh, and everything. So I think that putting them together is not actually that hard. I think that for our, on our side, we see our job as like, we are the exchange. So we build the tech and we build the markets, right? And we need to have a lot of markets, but it's completely fine for us to have a market that is going to trade hundreds of millions and it's more institutional. And for us to have one like, rotten tomato market that is more degen and people are having more fun there i think it's completely fine for us to do uh both it's just more a strategy on like distribution uh and things like that but it's definitely changed a lot internally how we do a lot of things uh now that we have more funds versus before but actually could you elaborate on that some like how, how has that changed yeah i think i think that well, on the tech side it definitely changed because we're now a lot more focus on we can't break uh, before. I think obviously we could never break, uh, but but we're now more focused on on things like robustness, reliability, performance is something that we weren't really worried about before. Now performance is a big part of, of the work that we do. Uh, also on the contract side, I think obviously we've done more contracts in Q1 than we've done all of last year. And actually we're already like growing like 75% uh, this quarter again. So we're doing more and more contracts, but we're putting a lot more focus on like how can we make these contracts very robust? How can we make sure like if there are edge cases, because they're going, they're, they're van contracts, there will be edge cases, but how do we make sure that the fall, that the, the edge cases are all being dealt in a way that makes sense and follow the spirit of the market versus just the rules and, 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 and things like that. Uh, so we, we're kind of changing kind of how we think about the contracts as a system in terms of um, their reliability also in some way. So the tech side, but also the contracts, which, the contracts are a system for us, right? It's it's almost like uh, it's an operation com almost the same as as, as tech is. Uh, so a lot of those things have have changed. It becomes even more important as we talk about, of course, like big market makers and funds. That becomes very important for them. But also, a lot of our growth is going on the very casual people. We're seeing a lot of. There's actually um, this new Eminem song, like Houdini or something. I think that's the name. And two weeks ago or a week ago, we got a ton of signups for people trying to see how how high will this song go on the billboard and it's like for those folks 
what they care about and what they're worried about, they're never going to read all the contract rules, right? It's our job to make sure that it, if they read the three lines that we summarize for them, it makes sense. Um, so on that end, for them, that robustness is also important, but not in the like the 30 page legal paper is perfect, but the contract is simple and correct. Um, so in some ways, different. I guess I've been rambling a bit, but in some ways they're different, but, but they kind of go together in what they need. That is crazy growth. I didn't realize so you guys were like 75% a quarter is insane. Um, <laughs> do you think that's mostly because like, I don't know, your marketing efforts have been paying off and you've been able to like, you know, latch onto things like Houdini and stuff like that and like get in the news more? Or is this like related to, I know this year, I think SIG came online and like liquidity is way better now. And that's like important part of the user experience. How much do you think is each of those? Yeah. So by the way, the 75% I meant was on the, on the number of contracts. So growth on that side. Uh, on the on the casual and like I think one thing that we've changed this year in terms of strategies, we've been a lot more focused on we're just gonna list an insane amount of contracts. And we're gonna go and try to do everything that we can. And like last year there were weeks that we would do like three new markets. I think this this year we're going to like 30, 40, soon enough we'll be like 50 new markets a week. Um, and we see a lot of like just more engagement of people because for a lot of the more casual folks, they don't think about uh, like the selling that much. They want to buy and they want to hold a position. And for them to engage them, you just, you get new markets. So they come back tomorrow and they're like, oh wow, there are new markets for me to trade on. There's new markets for me to trade on. And I think that that's kind of the, the engagement we want to see. But in terms of, I think a lot of our growth recently has been because we have a lot of contracts that are related to the news and on things that are going very viral. So for example, um, yeah, so that, for example, a new song uh, that's going like this, or when Taylor Swift released a new album, we had like 20 contracts related to that, and then we saw a lot of people coming in uh, because of that specific thing. So I think we, we really piggyback out of the out of the events, and we're seeing a lot of growth kind of coming from, coming from, uh, coming from there. Are there any types of um, contracts that you've been surprised at how much interest they got, or surprised at how little interest they got? Yeah, oh, actually, yes. Uh, so there's two examples from the past like couple of months i guess that one of them is we launched these rotten tomato markets and people just love them and i did not expect like look i follow i love movies i follow them a little bit but i thought it would be kind of another somewhat niche market and it's kind of taken over our discord discussion about uh about in the in the culture side and uh and the entertainment side um something that didn't and i think that one is was very expected so i'm a big foodie and there's the james beard awards for like big restaurants or whatever. So I was like, we gotta do it. We gotta launch these markets. Cause like people care, you know, it's like good food and people will care. And I feel like it got like $6. <laughs> so people clearly do not care. I will have my, I, I wanna do another market on like Michelin stars and see if maybe that, that's my last try on the food side. And then I'm just, I feel like I should just stop. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like, I don't know, competing with sports, movies, and elections is going to be, I don't know if anything's going to get that big. Fair, fair, fair. <laughs> so going back to the um, actual mechanisms of how this works, because I think this is one of the things that I find most interesting about Kalshi is um, I know um, like Polymarket and Manifold both had AMMs for a while and like also have limit order books now. And I know liquidity works a little bit differently with you guys, or like it's a central order. I, I don't, I'll let you explain yeah. it, but can you talk about how liquidity works a bit? Because I think this is a key part of things right. people underestimate. Yeah, so we follow the kind of traditional model, which is central limit order book. So people can put, uh, to explain, is you, you kind of say, I'm willing to buy at a certain price, and people can put make a market on both sides, like I'm willing to buy it. 45 and I'm willing to sell at this price. Uh, and then other people can come in and trade um, against them. Uh, that's kind of the, 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 the central structure that we use, the central limit order book, which is kind of what everyone uses. But we are experimenting and we want to experiment with more things. Uh, for example, we uh, like request for quote so that you can kind of request, um, say I want to buy this amount and then other people can say, okay, I'm willing to, to sell to you at this price uh, and, and do that. Because I think events have a very they're very particular things about events structures. Like people are very worried about sniping, which basically means a piece of new dro news drops and then you go and you clear the book and the people that are providing liquidity, uh, they kind of get screwed over because uh, they were there in the book providing liquidity, being nice guys, but then they get sniped. And that's something that worries a lot of liquidity providers for, for these events um, and things like that. And I think that we want to experiment with more and more of these structures to kind of make uh, trading on these markets a little bit easier to get more liquidity for, which I think it's a big, for some of these like more snipey events, they, some of them are extremely interesting and we want to have 
like probabilities for them, but they become very hard to to market make. So we, we want to experiment with with more of these things going forward. Yeah. So like, how, I mean, if you're allowed to tell us some of the details, like how does that agreement with say like SIG work um, to yeah, like, I mean, they don't want to get sniped, but you guys want to have liquidity. So, like, what's the middle ground? Yeah, that, that is a great question. Uh, so, the, the terms of the agreement are what's, what can be public is public uh, on, on our website. <laughs> um, I think that, well, SIG started with a couple of markets and their plan is to expand. They're big believers in prediction markets. Actually, the, the founder of SIG, uh, Jeff Yass, even wrote uh, an op-ed, I think, for Washington Post or maybe something like that, um, talking about how he thinks prediction markets will be his legacy to the world even though he has like $30 billion and built like a massive market, uh, market making fund and things like that. Um, and they are starting mainly with financials and economics and spend, expanding from there. And I think it really depends on how we as a whole devo like evolve our market structure uh, and, and things of the sort. For example, I'm sure if we get elections, we're gonna have not just them, but a lot of different funds coming to, coming to trade. Uh, so I think it just depends on, on a lot of different things. But I think a lot of our, the, the liquidity program and so, we have the liquidity program that's uh, for, for market making agreement, which is on that side, that's basically, it's more focused on top of book liquidity uh, on specific markets. And then we have our volume incentive program that is more for retail traders. Um, that is more on the like bringing, like the focus is a little different, uh, and, and but everyone can get rebates on, on that too, depending if you hit certain volume thresholds. Um, so even everyone that's here can, can also use some, some get some sort of incentive for, for trading and providing liquidity and all this. Totally makes sense. Uh, I'm curious, what uh, what are you most excited for this year in like the, you know, what, what maybe new features that are gonna launch, I don't know, big campaigns that you're gonna try, new swaths of like contracts you'll offer? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think there's two big things that, well, there's one big thing we're very excited about this year, uh, which is really integrated with brokers. So one of the benefits of being like a regulated exchange is that um, we can connect with brokers. So you can go to your Robinhood, Webo, Schwab, E-Trade, all of those those accounts that you already have and trade on our, our contracts. The same way that if you buy an S&P future, you're doing it through your IBQR account. Uh, or if, you, um, you know, if you're trading a stock, you're probably also doing that uh, for a broker. And we are integrating with a couple of brokers now and launching this year. Uh, which we're very excited about. Because I think that, as I said, like our goal is to make prediction marks as big as possible and to be that centerpiece. And I think connecting with the financial world and ecosystem is very important uh, to, to, to get there. Uh, so I think we're very excited to see. We've been working for the past year and a half. A lot of our focus internally is really building infrastructure for a lot of what we're shipping uh, at the end of this year. We really also want to own, like we are soon enough uh, going to own end-to-end -end, uh, the infrastructure of, of what we're doing. I think right now we are connected to a lot of third parties and we're gonna own uh, the entire infrastructure soon. Um, and I think that our hope for the end of the year is that with these brokers, we start bringing prediction markets more and more into the mainstream of people that have never heard about Manifest. Well, you know, uh, how do we get them in and how do we get them to, to get uh, started in trading? In terms of things that like on the more like uh, our direct like app and website and things like that, we actually, shipped something last week, which is the make a market feature that you can now go to our app and suggest a market and other people can upvote it, downvote it, and you kind of can track it through the process of like, we're certifying this market, we're killing this market or something like that, uh, which I think I'm excited for because I think that we've kind of, I feel like we've centralized the making a market process too much in terms of like what Kaoshi wants to do. It's kind of this black box of like, people send it on Discord or like email us and, and somehow sometime later it shows up on the website. And I think that making that more transparent hopefully brings the users more into into the process and we're gonna get better markets, so. Yeah, that, that seems way more mature than like two years ago when it was just the co-founders look at Twitter and decide. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, will, I mean, what what's the sort of limit for the number of contracts you can get approved per week though? I mean, even, I mean, I've always been impressed that you guys have less than a day turnaround with the CFTC on most most of these, but still like 50 a week feels very different than the fire hose of like random stuff people are gonna surely ask with this tool. Yeah, so it's still, so people can ask and we still have to write them and do, cause every single contract we do is a legal document, right? It's like, it has the terms and conditions and you know, it's like, 
payout criterion and the settlement source and there's analysis on like the hedging and economic utility there's an analysis on manipulation analysis on the 23 core principles that the cftc uh cares about and all of those things uh so we still have to write all of those we're not going to make the users write them we'll, we'll write them and uh send them in but there's no uh limit on the number that we can do we obviously like it's important for us that the cftc like likes us because you know there are other things that are not contracts that we're trying to get through them uh like sign up incentives or different structures that we're talking about all of those things we need to pass by them so uh we try to be conscious of that but uh there is no limit uh, and as you said it's a one-day turnaround i think that i don't know i feel like if we get to hundreds maybe they're gonna get a little annoyed but i think so far, so far we're doing okay so that's good to hear um what besides elections what are the ones that take more than a day or like non-trivial to get them to approve or something like that yeah that's a great question i would say elections really are the if we were to send sports i think that would be that would be a similar uh similar situation uh but generally there are uh, a couple of things that the cftc uh won't allow markets on some are like even coming from like the the like like congress which is there's two very fun ones one is box office futures so you cannot have markets on box office. That's very, very illegal. Uh, Why specifically that? Yeah, it's, well, th the history is that they actually tried to do it. And I think in 2012, maybe that's the year that they tried to do it, maybe 2010. They tried to do it. The CFT actually approved it. But then there was an insane amount of lobbying while Dodd-Frank was being made after the financial crisis. And uh, Hollywood was like, we don't want people gambling on this. This is terrible. And then Congress just folded it in on Dodd-Frank and put it that you can't. Uh, trade on box office futures. Uh, the other one that we definitely cannot do is even funnier. It's onions. So there was uh, a time that there, the onion market was corned, cornered. Uh, and uh, instead of thinking that was a problem with markets and we need to you know, see how we can surveil and make sure that this is not going to uh, gonna you know happen. Wait, let me guess. It was the onions' fault. Exactly. They thought it was the onions' fault. So, uh, so they just say you cannot have markets on onions. Um, and sometimes when we are like tired of the CFT, we're like, maybe we should just certify a market on the price of shallots and see what they're going to say, what they're going to say about that, you know? Um, but otherwise, I think there, there are other things like war, terrorism, like probably whoever follows college, she was like, why didn't they have anything on the Israel situation or Ukraine? And we don't do markets on war, terrorism, assassination um, for, I think, uh, of course, regulatory reasons, but also I think there's... Um, there's a reason why those markets, I think, maybe with real money are not uh, the way to go. Um, and and that. But I, I would say that, except for sports, the other stuff is pretty, pretty obvious. And most of the other stuff just goes through. And I, I, sometimes I have, like, re reasonable concerns about manipulation of things. Like, how the standard is, like, readily susceptible to manipulation. So it, it doesn't need to be absolutely impossible to manipulate. It's almost impossible to claim anything is impossible to manipulate. Uh, but is this, like, readily susceptible and then... Uh, of course, our job is to make sure that we're only listing markets for the users also that are not readily susceptible to manipulate. Have you seen any examples of like meaningful market manipulation? I know on some other platforms, this is like a feature of some markets, um, but <laughs> I assume you guys are a little less down for that. Yeah, so, well, I, I cannot discuss specific um, cases or anything like that, but one thing that comes with being regulated is that we have a full surveillance system uh, that is surveilling markets real time and flagging anything that might be suspicious or might be bad or might be anything like that. And then there's like compliance investigations um, and everything like that. Um, we've have we've I don't think we've had anything uh, too big, but of course I can I can just you know talk about specific things. That's fair. Um, where where do you stand on? Um or I know insider trading is not allowed on Kalshi. Um, I know a lot of people who like prediction markets think insider trading is good because it'll make them more accurate. Um, where do you stand on that personally, irrespective of the, of the company? And do you think that's like a, a thing that you'll, you'll ever be able to flex on? Or is that just like, ah, sorry, this prediction market is not going to have insider trading? Yeah, no, I, we definitely cannot have <laughs> insider trading. Uh, absolutely not. Um, and... I think it depends. I think it, it depends on what the goals are. And I think that that's, um, that's kind of how the different school of thoughts are, are on this issue. If, if your goal is like we want to maximize information at, you know, no matter what, uh, then I think there is a good argument for why, like, if you have insider information, you can move a price and get more accurate information that's better. But if you think about on the trading perspective and on people actually trading in like a 
being motivated to trade and safe, trading in a safe place, it's important to make sure these things don't happen. Because if I go and I trade today and then I realize I was trading against the heading side information, I'm not going to come back tomorrow. And then in the long run, we're going to have very small, sharky niche markets that are not going to get to the scale uh, and the benefits that we want uh, for the public. So I think that there are, there are things that theoretically, not just about this, that theoretically in the world are very good, but when you talk about real life, they, they look a little different. And I think that uh, for us, of course, we cannot allow insider trading, we can't allow spoofing, we can't allow any of these things. Um, but I think on a principled level, like it's it's fair to, to have kind of guardrails to make sure that it's a fair game for everyone. So we, we really care about this. Uh, it, even if the CFTC said it's fair game, I think we wouldn't we wouldn't be okay with it. Yeah, it does seem like there's a tricky tension between sometimes the like what the market makers want is different from what the market takers want, right? And I don't know, like the yeah, the people who come to trade in the market because they like have strong opinions about it. Um, you would I don't know maybe set things up differently to like optimize for them versus set things up differently to protect the like liquidity providers from getting sniped right by someone who like happens to know the answer first or something like that. I'm curious I don't know what what side of this two sided market has been harder to attract to the platform like the liquidity provider side or the traders. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that in some ways the liquidity providers they're they're easier to understand because it's very clear what they want. They want to make money. Um, so in some ways, if you have an environment that they can make money, they're going to come. Um, and the traders on the other side is more, it is more complex because they obviously, they want to trade on something they have opinions on, or they think they have an edge on, but they also might be motivated by a lot of different things. Um, and I think for us, we've been way more focused on, on getting the retail traders and the takers, uh, cause we really see them as like unlocking the demand for, for something as new prediction markets is more important because if we have that much demand, there will be money for the market makers to make and they will come. Uh, so that's why historically we focused a lot more on the on the taker and the consumer and the retail side. Uh, and I think that won't change. Uh, I think that we are always going to be focused on, on that side. And I think that if we do a good job there, we're gonna see growth, we're gonna see more demand, we're gonna see, and then the market makers are going to come. And then even if we go up the scale of talking about banks and funds and stuff like that, I think that it's still more important to think of the folks that are getting actual value from trading on this and not just from, you know, getting collecting spread or, or providing liquidity. Because if you get the people that see actual value from hedging, from all these other other um, reasons, the other side will come. So so has been the focus and will continue to be the focus. Totally, totally makes sense. Should we open it up to questions from Perfect. some of the traders let's do or it. anyone really? I'm going to go around like clockwise. So let's start with people somewhere here. Hi, so you have discussed a bit how hard it can be to market make markets with high information asymmetry. It sounded a bit like by making sure that insiders are not trading in the markets, you can protect liquidity providers a little bit. Uh, I wanted to, I, I guess I have two questions. Is SIG gonna select the markets that they provide liquidity for and where they maybe have their own good models and uh, yeah, and what do you do in those cases when you want to open many, many markets on random stuff? Yeah, those are great questions. So yes, uh, SIG chooses the markets that they are, I guess, obliged by our agreement with them to provide liquidity on certain levels and blah, blah, blah. Um, and they are announced on their website. So every new market that they're going to be market making on that specific, with those specific parameters are also on the website. Uh, it's announced before, so every trader uh, will know. Um, what was the second question, sorry? Oh, yes. Uh, so we actually have an affiliate from the exchange, so a completely different company that uh, helps provide liquidity and like seed liquidity on, on the markets. Um, and they are very much more focused on the like long tail of markets. Um, say again, I think that other market makers that we're in talks with, they're going to focus more, well, they're going to focus on the markets they want. Um, and But we can't, as, a, as, a, as an exchange, kind of depend on them uh, for the, the group of number of contracts that we're talking about. So we have our own internal arm, uh, another company that, that, that trades on those markets and provide liquidity. Uh, and those are, that's another thing that we want to experiment with. Um, for example, as I said, we have rebates programs for, for everyone open to every single person, um, and tilting and, and making this, this rebate program actually work to, uh, to be more focused on events or, and the long tail of markets versus the markets that we already have, like 
good enough liquidity in a way. Um, and all of those things, things that we're going to be experimenting and changing this rebate program to kind of help focus like little guy, I guess, liquidity on, on, on those. So, yeah. Actually, a follow up on that. For your, you know, not in-house, but affiliated uh, like market maker, um, is that just intended to lose money and subsidize things on purpose to improve the user experience? Or is this like, a, oh, it, the big market makers aren't ready to come yet, so we'll just make a normal market maker that's like, you know, going to be roughly neutral, but is willing to operate in markets that have, you know, like 10 open contracts or something? Yeah, that's fair. So, by the way, there's no like agreement between the two. So they can actually do whatever they want, uh, the, the trading affiliate. Uh, but the goal is to provide liquidity and lose as little money as possible. Uh, I mean, obviously we don't we don't want to just. It's it's also bad as like a company perspective. Like we're trying to build like a, a real business, so just giving money for free we actually don't validate anything. Um, so a lot of the goal is to just like provide as much liquidity as possible, uh, being kind of net zero if possible. Or uh, but there is no obligation. There is nothing that they have to do. Uh, they're completely independent company. Uh, I actually barely, like talk to them very infrequently, um, and but but that's kind of like their their mandate as a company is to do that. Um, it's not really a question, but you had mentioned earlier um, someone had asked how to make a comment to the CFTC, mm -hmm. and I think someone posted a link in oh, amazing. Discord, and it has suggested comments and questions that they could ask the CFTC. Oh, perfect! That's yeah. amazing. Yes, do that. Please submit comments. <laughs> Hey, thanks for being the time, uh, taking the time to be here. Uh, you had said it's important that the CFT likes you guys, and I guess, and and you know, obviously that matters a lot to election uh, prediction markets, maybe sports if you think about that someday, etc. I guess my question is, how do you balance uh, markets you describe as degen and sort of serving some subset of customers who want those, the rotten tomatoes markets, without sort of upsetting CFTC commissioners or uh, you know, congressmen, et cetera, who don't really understand or have the same utility function? Yeah, that's a great question. And by the way, I'll, I'll clarify what I meant by <laughs> the, the DGEN markets. I think that um, we still see, even in Rotten Tomatoes, act, like it was actually interesting. We saw this like on, I think it was our third, we, we saw the Rotten Tomatoes started trading more and more and then we're like, who are these people? So we reached out to a bunch of the traders. There were a lot of new traders um, and a lot of them actually work in the movie industry and they actually were interested in you know following they 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 thought that uh they they wanted to they, they actually wanted to participate for other reasons that are not like the gen reasons like actually related to their jobs and and uh how different production companies etc i won't get into too much detail they, they were doing so but what i mean by 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 the gen is that there is a group of people that will think those markets are really fun which i think is I'm sure there are a lot of people that, that think our Fed interest rate markets are very fun, but I think it's fewer people uh, than, than that would think that our billboards or, or Rotten Tomato markets are fun. But we still have that that other side. And that's why every new market we put on the platform will have that economic utility and will have like the hedging and, and, and the price basing that we see as important. That's why we probably won't have as many absolutely crazy markets as some other platforms out there. Um, but in terms of balancing, I think that... Um, in, in terms of like this, the, the CFTC liking us, I think it, it's less about liking us, but making sure that uh, we're working well together and that uh, there's an approach of like we can bring new ideas that we want to do and get feedback and kind of like work iteratively with them uh, and all of those things. And I think that's important for us because, as I said, like the contracts are a part of it, but market structure changes and market making programs and integrating with brokers and all of those things are also very important for us. Um, and it's important to make sure that they are working on on our stuff and and uh trying to make progress there but um but yeah they've, they've actually been very uh receptive to a lot of like this these types of other more alternative uh type markets and, and everything like that and i think that our goal is to keep doing markets everywhere from like the jobs numbers all the way to to uh you know hurricanes of course that um and stuff like that there was actually one um in the student loan forgiveness, I think that, or like forbearance, one of those two markets, there was actually, I think someone that sent a letter to the CFTC explaining how they used our market to hedge uh, their own student loans and whether they would have to start paying them again. Uh, and all of these things, of course, like help make the case that we are doing things that, that make sense. So I think that, um, that yeah, I think, I don't think the CFTC does not like us. I think that, I think they like us. And I think the biggest thing is the, 
the election stuff that we're going to let the courts decide what's who's right. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, thanks for your talk. Is it the case that um, isn't it the case that you can like perpetually subsidize some of these markets because the information gain, or like the economics need to be worked out where the money comes from? But it it doesn't need to be the case that you can't subsidize markets in perpetuity. Um, that's one question, and then another question is, um, what are the most popular markets for these market makers? Those are two great questions. Um, the first one. Yes, uh, we could. Um, I just don't think it's the, the model that we are going after. I think that it would work, for example, if we were selling the information or the data, then we can offset that by that much that we subsidize and things like that. But that's not, we're going for a more traditional kind of like exchange business model, taking transaction fee and all of those things. Um, and, but I, maybe there is a world in which we try other models and, and things like that. And I think that I, you're correct. I don't think there's a one one size fits all, like one answer for this. I think there's many issues that the way that we are doing uh, doesn't really make sense with infinitely subsidizing markets. Um, and on the second question, um, well, the, the most, the biggest markets on the platform, I would say that probably like Fed and inflation are, are some of the biggest uh, ones, have always been the biggest ones. Uh, we do have uh, like markets relating to like S&P, NASDAQ, Bitcoin, all of those do a lot of volume as well. Uh, there we have like daily markets on, on a lot of those like t-notes fx all of those things those do a lot of volume as well um then obviously the ones like oscars and grammys all of that stuff there's a lot of volume and then we have like one off uh like for example the TikTok ben uh market that did very well uh specific like government shutdown or debt ceiling all of that uh so i would say it's like there is a couple of markets that always do very well and then whatever's in the news usually picks up a lot of volume and a lot of attention The question was, aren't there already really robust and mature markets for things like Bitcoin derivatives? Like, why do yours exist? Yeah, the, I'll, I'll answer the Fed one. So he also asked about the, the Fed one. Uh, and I think that I actually, there's actually a couple of papers out there saying that our markets are better at forecasting interest rates than uh, Fed funds futures, which is like the, the other big one. And there are different, uh, there are different aspects of why you would use uh, certain things. I think that our markets actually... Um, the CME markets or Chicago Mercantile Exchange does the, the big one and it's uh, they overreact a lot. I, I can actually put the paper on Discord. This actually would be better than me trying to <laughs> summarize it. Um, and in terms of the Bitcoin, I think it's, it, well, it, it's a different structure because we do binary options. Uh, not binary, it's like, a, yeah, it's like event contracts on, the, on, on like Bitcoin and stuff like that. And I think there is, a, there's different benefits and different structures to, to, to different things. And I think that you can use but uh, this type of event contract structure for a lot of different things. So it's like, I would say with this financials, I would say it's more like the more options that people can decide what they want to trade on, the better. But yeah. Sorry, uh, I work at Kausch. I just wanted to provide a bit more color on your question <laughs> about the accuracy of the markets. So yes, the existing uh, Fed interest rate future markets are very good at what they do. But what they do is only tell you the average expected rate a year from now, right? So you can say, hey, a year from now, the average expected rate will be 4.5. Uh, at Cauchy, the differential is you get a distribution. So you get like, what's the like five per the fifth percentile lowest rate that you can expect? And you say, oh, that's 2% rate. And what's the 95th percentile? And that will be like a 525 rate. Uh, and that's not something you can get from the future. So what we're providing is just um, perhaps less accurate because there's money, but uh, just materially more detailed than what you get from futures. Yeah, one thing is also the size. I think the notional that you need for those is like four hundred thousand dollars to get started. Uh, we are one dollar, so I think that that makes <laughs> that makes a big difference. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, kinks like that, but I think that like the notional size is a big uh, a big one. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is like on the on the forecasting sides, like even on things that are not direct, like inflation. Our inflation markets actually beat like 
I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but <laughs> every single like expectation from from Bloomberg and and all the banks and stuff like that. And I think that even with the size that we currently have, which uh, is uh, the size that we currently have, I guess it's uh, we already beat these expectations by a lot. And I think that um, once the markets grow, we're going to see kind of like the real value of these markets everywhere. Um, and the things that we already t we spend a lot of time looking at inflation and jobs and all of those things, and we are, are like already outperforming uh, kind of everything. And I think that uh, the more markets we have, the more we kind of be able to to see all that. Do you have a sense for why you're more accurate? Is it like actually the markets are big enough that it was worth it to someone to think really hard about this and come up with a better estimate than Bloomberg? Or is this just like pure wisdom of the crowds, like everyone bets and it ends up being right more often than like Bloomberg is right alone? That That is a great question. I think it's a mix of both. Uh, we have some traders that have made an absurd amount of money on predicting inflation. Uh, so I would say, you know, they, they, them coming to the markets and trading and doing the research is very valuable. But I do think that obviously we have a lot more traders and when there is a market, you know, uh, wisdom of the crowds just, just brings it together. But we do have a couple of traders that just made an absurd amount of money. It was like more than a full-time salary uh, trading specifically um, inflation. Um, yeah, and I think that for, I don't actually know how a lot of these, like the Bloomberg forecasts or like the, the ones coming from banks, but I really think it's just like, a couple of researchers being like, eh, I think this makes sense, let's write that. And then they write it and, you know, they're just like, wow, shocking, it was not what was expected. And then they move on and there's no no repercussion, nothing that happens to, to them. Uh, so I think that it's a mix of, of both things. You have very big, very people putting the time and doing it, but I think it's just in general wisdom of crowds. Yeah, Hey, so you were talking about markets that you wouldn't do due to maybe ethical reasons like war. You do have some markets for COVID and measles, for instance. What's your thinking around that? <laughs> that's a great. Uh, that's a great question. Well, our thinking is that the information that we get from those markets is well. There's a couple of things. I think the first one is in an assassination market, you do have the incentive. Like you might say, for example, if you have a market of Nate's going to be assassinated. You could say there's an, an incentive for someone to try to, you know, try to go and, and, and kill him uh, and, and things like that. Um, I would say that the, the thing with COVID and measles is that the, the, the social value that comes from predicting how these things are going to go and like the value even for like, you know, the, the public like agencies that look into these things and, and, and for everyone is so important. And I think it's, it is not easy to manipulate uh, and to try to do something very very bad to change those those numbers i don't think i just don't think it's that easy to go around and try to spread covid to everyone uh and 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 i think that that's kind of how how we do it i think that the value of it is so high uh on actually a public policy kind of perspective and i think they're actually very hard to manipulate and, and i think there's way more indirect um because you could you could also claim that for example like um for ex I'll give a crazy example, but like shorting Tesla and you have an incentive to try to kill Elon Musk because you're shorting Tesla. So, so I think that like, there's always incentive to do things. It's more of a matter of like where you draw the line. And I think the direct incentive of like having a market on someone being killed, I think that that's, that's kind of where, uh, I, obviously I draw the line personally. And I think that also how regulators clearly draw the line on, on things that are like war, terror. Also the other thing you need to think about is that the CFTC's perspective, they are not thinking about our market on the size of what prediction markets are now. They're thinking if the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or if ICE try to list this market and it's gonna have billions and billions and billions of dollars traded, what can happen? And in that point, you start f realizing like why they probably have a problem with a war market being out there uh, and how that's different from from, from other things. Because, um, and I think that, that that's how a lot of, how the regulators think is that they have to think about what can go wrong in the big scale because that's what they also regulate. Um, and I think that if you think about it in that scale, it kind of becomes a little bit more clear how some markets uh, you shouldn't have. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Do you have market makers that engage in payment for order flow? Or if you think about scaling up orders of magnitude in the future, um, how are you thinking about that? Would you use a speed bump approach or like what lessons are there to draw from industry on that? 
Yeah, so, so we don't uh, we don't do payment for order flow uh, or anything like that. We just charge fees for for everyone, uh, and that's kind of our our current business model. Not for everyone. To to clarify, like there's a maker taker fee. So if you're providing liquidity, you don't pay fees. If you're taking, you pay fees. Uh, in terms of other things, I mean, I I won't say that we won't explore anything in the future. We might. Uh, I think that prediction markets and event contracts are so new that we need to be open to exploring a lot of different things to see the structure that will work the best. Uh, but we are not thinking about any of these things right now, especially payment for order flow is not something we're thinking, uh, we're thinking about. Hey, um, how are you guys thinking about international expansion, if at all? That's a great question. Um, I actually answered this question a lot of times today. Um, we definitely want to expand internationally. Um, so why why haven't we done it yet? Um, the biggest thing for us is like we were the first like D approved DCM, which is the technical CFTC term for for what we do uh, in the U.S. to do prediction markets. And it was very it's very important for us to be like let's really grow this in the U.S., make it a big thing, like try to win as much of the market as we can and grow the market as much as we can. Um, so that's why we haven't done that uh, historically. If you ask me in the next year, I would say it's probably like a 70 to 80% chance we'll start going internationally. Uh, and I think the way that we'll do that is probably through brokers more than like going, like expanding, like just bringing our app to Europe or Brazil or, 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 or China or something. It would probably be partnering with brokers in these locations and then having them uh, kind of do the distribution and, and everything like that. So that's probably uh, how we do it because of course, like what we do is regulated in a lot of different ways in a lot of different countries. And I think it's important for us to do things the right way. So it would be more about how we do that and who are the right partners for this type of, this type of thing. Uh, what was the reaction at Calci to the Manifold sweepstakes news? And was that something that you had predicted might happen with some uh, alternative uh, prediction market at some point or that you ever considered? Well, that's 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 a funny question. I um, I don't think there was much of a reaction, to be honest. Uh, I think that um, we are really focused on what we're doing, and I think that's kind of uh, I think Manifold's great. I think Manifold is like I, but I think it's interesting about the, the prediction market industry out there is like everyone took a completely different approach uh, to to solving the same. It's like it's not the same problem. Everyone took a very different approach to building uh, somewhat related things. Uh, and I think it's really cool to see people um, exploring uh, different things. It's funny because when we were in YC actually in 2019, uh, with my co-founder and I, we were trying to figure out how we were going to do this. Uh, we really cared about the regulatory piece, but we're like, how how do we figure it out? And I think that something we, we thought about and decided not to do was the, this was the sweepstakes situation, and we wanted to just go fully on on this path. And I think that um, we ended up being very different. But I don't think there's a there's like a reaction uh, per se. I think I, I hope I hope it works out. <laughs> oh, and you asked how would I have priced it? I don't know. I I, I honestly have no no idea. Uh, but I think it's you know every company out there that's not a nonprofit wants to make needs to figure out a way to make money. Uh, so it makes sense that like if a company deals with money, that is going to make more money. So I think it makes sense. Um. Do you have any plans to raise any more money? Have you thought about a community round? Let us uh, get in on this. <laughs> um, well, um, I think that uh, uh, not everything that we've done is, is public yet. And I think that uh, at the moment, we're fully focused on um, building the best product we can and launching with brokers and having the end-to-end -end infrastructure and doing all of that. So at the moment, we're not thinking about about uh, any more more rounds, and but we have a lot of money to 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 for now to to see a lot of this goes through and then in the next round we will i i've talked to we will i will make an argument to my co-founder he's the ceo so he does the fundraising uh about the community round so i have an interlude question okay. <laughs> what positions do you currently have open on call sheet oh well you mean, oh, I, I can trade on Couch. No, no employee can trade on Couch at all. Uh, Why is that? I mean, it kind of makes sense, but. Yeah, it's regulatory wise, we just cannot uh, have any employee trade for conflict of interest because we are the ones selling the market. So 
imagine tomorrow someone has a million dollars and then someone's like whoops i misclicked um so absolutely prohibited uh for any employee to trade we actually have an internal like no money demo like environment uh trading and i'm very i'm just very big on the music markets it's just it's like my niche and I, I i do very well on those i try to get out of it last week and i don't think i'll recover from from for many weeks on the competition uh of i should just focus on what i'm good at um but positions on the company though not on on the exchange if anyone wants to be an engineer all of those things we are hiring so <laughs> please uh apply if you're interested in what we do um yeah that was a very smooth segue <laughs> um i should also mention that Kalshi is doing a breakfast tomorrow morning from 8 30 to 10 so you should come yes. by and hang out yes um and also a trading workshop right after that tomorrow with vouchers and like advice and stuff on how to get started and yep. last but not least office hours right after this so yes if you want to talk some more about prediction markets in Kalshi uh I don't know where it is, but just follow Luana after this. <laughs> it's right. You, you probably all saw we're giving these nice t-shirts and hats, so it's it's by there. And one thing tomorrow in the in the trading thing, we're gonna actually have uh, some of our big traders help and like talk through how they trade and stuff like that. So it'll be really cool. All right, last question. Any other fun stories of like like the one with the hedging student loans of like I don't know, just heart heartwarming uses of of call share. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there. Actually, there actually is quite a few. I think one of the interesting ones, I think is really related to um, hurricanes. Um, we have hurricane markets for a lot of different cities in, in Florida, New Orleans, all those things. Um, and we actually saw during hurricane season, people in areas that they could not buy hurricane insurance or they could, but they were very worried about hurricane actually coming and buying positions on Kalashi too. Obviously we're not insurance, all of those things are very different. Um, it's it's more so much like anyway it, we're not insurance um but there are a lot of places that insurance actually got out of of like florida keys and, and new orleans and stuff like that and by buying like anything above a category one hitting my city people were somehow protecting themselves on like deductibles or just every like if they had insurance or just any protection they they could and i think that that's that's a very interesting one that we we thought it was very interesting. We actually leaned into um, it a little bit and actual hurricane season just started. Uh, so we're excited to see this year that we're bigger than last year, how that's gonna um, pan out. And I think a similar one with gas that we've seen a lot of people actually come hedge uh, gas prices. Cause we've had a lot of different gas prices in a lot of different uh, places. Nowadays, gas price is a little bit more stable, but there were like some crazy times last year. Um, and we saw some people coming in. And it's very interesting to see how those users on board versus you know, a trader or someone that understands prediction markets, like they don't understand the prices. They don't understand almost anything. Uh, but when you talk them through, they kind of, they get the concept of like, I buy this, I'll get this. And then I can offset this amount of money. And they are like, um, and seeing that kind of, um, that kind of use case was very interesting. So it's similar to the student loan uh, um, one, but someone a little bit more different because it's less. I guess the hurricane is an event uh, as well, but the gas one's less, so it's a price thing. I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming Thank out you and so taking much. the time. Thank you. And you guys should all sign up and download our app. Thank you. <laughs>